So let me read Ephesians 4, chapter 1, uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now grace has been given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners into captivity. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean? except that he descended to the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended is the same as the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the training of the saints in the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ, until we all reach unity in the faith, and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. You might like to keep that in front of you or turn it over to, to make some notes. Are you familiar with a piece of music? It's usually called Ravel's Bolero. It's quite famous, so lots of you will know it. It has a very constant rhythmic drum beat for something like seven minutes. And on YouTube, there's a video. Initially, the director gets the camera to focus in on the back of the conductor, but then he slowly scans and focuses in on the drummer. Now, that takes about 20 seconds. So for six minutes and 40 seconds, you're watching this drummer do the same thing, carry the same beat. But, and it doesn't change. It gets a little bit louder. And then right in the last second, there's a tiny little bit of difference. So the drummer's there just doing the same thing. The director could have focused in on something much more interesting, the oboes, for instance. But he doesn't. He draws our attention to the drummer. And what happens is that your ear goes where the camera goes because we're such visual things, you hear his part so clearly. And he looks bored. He looks terribly bored because he's doing the same thing. Yet, the performance is great. They're all playing different instruments. The drummer is doing the part he has been allocated. The oboes play their part. The music would not be Ravel's Bolero without them all playing their different parts. The parts are not what is important, are they? They make it up. What is important is the entire piece of music. All its different parts blended together perfectly. God's mob are like an orchestra. There is unity, there is diversity. The unity is set by the head of God's mob, Christ. He's like the conductor. He has given diverse gifts to all of God's mob. He has delegated some among that mob to work on his behalf, to shape the mob. And their role is like getting the orchestra sections, the violins, the trumpets, the woodwind, all working 
together, blending together off the same piece of music. But who's in control? Jesus. He is their focus as they play. He determines the music that they play. He determines the style. He determines the pace. The music is his. We're going to look at more of that in a minute. Before we do, we need to ask God's help as we look at his word. Lord, it is only by your Holy Spirit that your word truly speaks to us and shapes us. We ask for him to be with us now as we look at your word. We ask for him to shed light on your word. And we ask that by his work in us, you would change us. And Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. A quick review of where we are. We're reading a letter written to the church in Ephesus, a large city in what is now Western Turkey. It's a port city. Paul's familiar with it. He was there about seven years ago. He lived there for two or three years. There were probably a whole lot of people in the church now that he doesn't know because it's a port city, lots of movement going on. In this church, there's both Jew and Gentile. They're not known for getting along too well. On the hill above the city, there's a temple to Diana. Paul is writing to this mob to remind them of their identity in Christ. Now, to them, it's relatively new, and it's under a whole heap of pressure from all that the world offers, from the port, from the temple on the hill, from all the different competing things that the world puts in front of them. And we were up to in Ephesians last week, Andrew brought us Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, a prayer to enable them to act in response to all that God has done for them. And this week, we begin to look at the behaviour that prayer is to enable. So we're at a turning point in Ephesians. It has two halves. Today we begin the second half. Paul has spent three chapters giving us the big picture of what God has done. God has a plan for his people, a plan he had before the beginning of the world. He's going to restore everything to its rightful order through Jesus. So in Christ, God has made them alive, alive to him. In Christ, he has made them one people, his people. And they are now members of his household alongside their Lord Jesus. That's the Ephesians' new identity. It's also our identity. Now Paul turns to how they should respond, how they should walk in their new identity. Now I'm going to use walk rather than live. I think it conveys better what Paul is trying to say. If you think about walking... You can't stay in one place unless you can moonwalk and I'm not going to try that. Um, running, you can run on the spot, you can jog on the spot, but you can't walk on the spot. If you take a step, you're going somewhere. You may not know where you're going, but you're going somewhere. So it's an active word and it has direction. The new identity of the Ephesian believers is God-established. That is what makes the therefore at the beginning of this passage so huge. They have a new identity and they are to walk in the light of that identity. It is a therefore that is meant to change lives. A walk unchanged by the remarkable action that God has taken does not belong to a person who has understood what God has done. I'll just say that again. A walk that is unchanged by such a remarkable action does not belong to a person who has understood what God has done. The more we understand it, 
the more our walk will be changed. A full understanding of salvation results in a hugely changed walk. Paul is himself one of the greatest examples of that. We remember that Paul used to persecute Christians. He used to murder Christians. And here he is in impri imprisoned for the Lord himself. Maybe that's why he mentions his imprisonment here as evidence of the change that an understanding of what God has done brings. Let's read those first three verses again. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. Paul is asking them to walk worthy of their calling. The Ephesians now belong to God's household. There is no hostility between themselves and God. And there's to be none among them either. We are to well remember, to remember well that God has removed the dividing wall of hostility. The walk of the people is to reflect that absence of hostility. When a cricketer is selected to the Australian cricket team, the competitive hostility he used to have with the other states, that's laid aside, isn't it? He moves from a state player to an Australian player. They're now members of the same team, the Australian team, and that membership takes priority over their former state duties. They now serve a larger goal. So it is with the Christian, except even more so. What does that say to us? You may feel some hostility towards someone else in the church in Narrabri or somewhere else in the church somewhere else. That is not to be. God's people are united by far greater things than personal hurts or grievances. We are to accept one another in love. Selection in an Australian team also creates an expectation of a certain level of behaviour. And it wasn't that long ago we all see what we saw what happens when that behaviour was um, breached. The sandpaper incident and all its fallout had far-reaching consequences, didn't it? It affected the team. It affected how we in Australia thought about the team. I can well remember a kid phoning in saying how his idols you know, just destroyed his thoughts about them. And it's also affected how other nations have thought about Australians. A walk that is unworthy of our calling from God will have similar consequences. It'll have consequences within us and it'll have consequences for those looking in on us from the outside. So walk worthy, brothers and sisters. We will do ourselves and the name of Christ great harm if we don't. But what does that worthy walk look like? It is a unified church. That is its principal characteristic. It's characterised by love and peace. It's a church filled with the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit are clearly evident. Humility and gentleness will be expressed patiently to those around us. It will lead us to bear lovingly with each other and it will bring peace between people. And that all results in a lack of division, a unity. First time I went to Synod was many years ago when I was at Wee Wall. 
I was lost in all the procedures. For those who haven't been, there are heaps of them. But one thing that spoke strongly to me, a fairly young believer at the time, was the way the debate was conducted. Members of God's household conducted themselves differently, differently enough that I noticed. People held very strong opinions and they expressed them very passionately. But they attacked the arguments, not the man. They still cared for each other. There was a desire to get their views out, but there was a mindfulness of what they were doing in expressing their views. Is this our mob here in Narrabri? Is our unity in Christ, our love for each other, held over and above our opinions? Does the way we conduct ourselves reflect the gifts of the Spirit? Is our conduct a witness to those around us, believers and non-believers alike? Let me read from verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. There's the unity that saves through the death of Christ. One, 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 repeated again and again. There is no Jew, no Gentile, no hostility, no dividing wall. We are all one in Christ. Why the repetition? I think it's because we're all a bit thick-headed. We're so good at looking at what divides us rather than focusing on what we hold in common. So good at thinking, I deserve this, or I am right, or I am hard done by, or maybe even we look at others and feel as if we're not getting what they're getting. All that worldly thinking divides us, doesn't it? So Paul reminds us again and again, we are one. We are one church body. We have one indwelling spirit. We have one hope for the life to come. We have one Lord Jesus to serve. We have one faith to which we hold. We express it all the time, don't we? One creed. We have one God who is our heavenly father of the household to which we belong. And we have one baptism, which is an outward sign to ourselves and to those around us. We belong to Christ. There are seven foundational truths here. You might say that anything outside those truths is secondary. Yet, with all that holding us together, when we are hurt, we forget them. Remember them. They are our unity, our oneness in Christ. These first six verses are an introduction to the rest of the letter in Ephesians. Walk worthy of the calling you have received. That worthy walk is unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ, which is expressed in peace and love among us. Now to the diversity. Reading from verse 7. Now grace has been given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners into captivity. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean except that he de descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is the same as the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, 
some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity, there it is again, in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Christ has given each one of us grace. This grace is not identical. It is according to the measures of Christ's gift. Don't get me wrong. Paul is not talking about the grace that saves from sins, as if some are more saved than others. He tells us, doesn't he, Christ gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors. They're different gifts. So the grace Paul is talking about here is the different gifts that each one of us have been given. These gifts are to be used to build up the body of Christ, the church. Remember the drummer I talked about? An orchestra has a drummer. A cricket team has its 12th man. He doesn't even get on the field until someone is injured or carries the drinks. Even then, all he's allowed to do is field. But the piece of music would be incomplete without the drummer. There'd be a whole lot more gaps in the field without the gifts and abilities of these seemingly minor members. You are not an accident in the body of Christ. You have been placed in a specific place, in a specific time, for a specific purpose. When you received the gifts Christ gave you, it was because he gave it to you in a measure suited to his good purposes for you and for those around you, for the body. And that applies to all God's people. If Paul draws our attention to those who are particularly gifted to train the rest of God's mob to use the gifts God has given them. So they might be a coach or an orchestra section leader a cricket team has assistant coaches, doesn't it? They might be bowling coaches, fielding coaches. Their job is to improve one aspect of the team's performance. But did you know that the wicket-keeping coach improves the bowling result? The wicket-keeper catches more catches, doesn't he? The bowling figures are better. The fielding coach lowers the opposition total, doesn't he? He affects the bowling figures. Better fielding makes the bowling figures better, less runs scored. So your gifts make the gifts of those around you more effective. These particular gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, they're all ministries of the word. They're all ministries that serve the people. They train, they build up in a way that builds maturity. It's a maturity that protects against dangers that we'll find in verse 14. Let's read that verse now. Then you will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. The mature man, back in verse 12, is not one of us. It's a picture of the church as a whole. It's a mature man who has one knowledge of Christ. He holds one faith. He has one hope. He's filled with one spirit. That's the mature church. It knows what it believes. 
Paul contrasts that with the immature church, who are little children, tossed about by the waves of persecution or ridicule. Little children who are swayed by every teaching they hear, whether the truth or not. They're an immature church that is deceived by cunning and human ways. They're an infant which looks to man for wisdom instead of the word of God. It's a church that does not hold to the anchor of truth it has been taught. It holds to a false hope, a false teaching, a teaching that casts, casts it adrift in the world of troubles. That's what the mature church, the building up that occurs under the teaching of God's, the people God has gifted, that is what's, what it's to guard against. Then in verses 15 and 16, Paul gives us another picture, this time of a healthy church, a growing church, a church growing into a likeness of Christ because of what is being spoken. You cannot fail to see the importance of what we speak to each other, whether it's, to our, whether it's our teachers who train us or just our words to each other. Our words are important. Are our words of Christ? Do they honour him? From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. We're to grow into Christ, but the growth also comes from Christ. I heard an orchestral conductor interviewed on the radio once. He said when he read the score for a symphony for the first time, he could hear the whole thing in his head. Perfect. Then he would begin the process of getting the orchestra to play what he had already heard. And they would never be perfect. The first time he read it was when it was perfect. We are to speak the truth of Christ to each other. We are to work at the part we have been given. We are far from sounding like a symphony. We actually seem to make quite a cacophony at times. But as Christ, our great conductor, gives us guidance, and as we rehearse under his guidance, we are knit together. Each part begins to sound like it should, to operate as it should. And we approach nearer to the symphony our Lord has in mind for us. Speaking the truth in love. That is the work each of us has, whatever our gifts, to aid our growth. But our growth is from Christ and it is into him we grow. Christ gives us everything. He brings us together as the orchestra. He gives us the instruments the gifts. He gives us the music, his word. He rehearses us. He corrects us. He teaches us what he wants from us. We may be the musicians, but we're a talentless slot without the gifts God's given us. But I think in that picture, Christ It's also the music. He is the symphony. He's what we're meant to sound like. He doesn't just hear it in his head, does he? He's slowly shaping us. 
Here is the picture to take away today. There is one united body, one church. It has been given many gifts by Christ. Those gifts are to be used so that the church grows in the fullness in Christ. We know we're already in Christ. Remember that from chapter 1. So much in Christ. But we are far from being like him. So we are to grow so that the church becomes completely like him. Our part in growing into fullness is to speak the truth in love, to use our gifts in the service of the whole body. We are also to become mature and not be swayed by the false wisdom and teaching of men. And last of all, disunity. It will do great harm. It will damage our witness to the community around us. It will damage the name of God and it will damage relationships within the church. So I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the spirit with the peace that binds us. Let me pray. Father, we are humble sinners. You have taken us, made us your people in your great mercy. We thank you, Lord. We realise that we are far, far from being a true reflection of yourself. Lord, help us. Please do your work in us. Make us more and more like our Lord Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen.